Well, good morning, everybody. How are we doing today? I see we've got folks who are tuning in online, and hopefully people are saying hello in the chat, so do wave and say hello to each other and, uh, and also to me. How are we all feeling this morning? Post-midterm blues? Well, I'll give you some good news. Um, on Well, two pieces of good news. One, the sun is shining, although if you're indoors watching a lecture, maybe that isn't good news. And two, we are coming up on the end of the term. So it's always a bit of a hard slog to get through these densely packed weeks of course material, but we are starting to get there. We're starting to, to get through it all. And we are now at a point where we have put an awful lot of tools in our programming toolbox. And we're going to continue to learn some more things. I'm going to show you some interesting data structures over the next few weeks. And also we're going to look at how computers actually represent numbers, how we represent integers, and how we represent floating point numbers, and how everything else follows on from that. Uh, but as we learn about these interesting things, we aren't going to have any... Uh, huge new concepts like functions, for example, or modules, or things like that. Okay. All right. Uh, so let me present, speaking of modules, let me present a question for you. Let's see how we do with this one. Also, uh, for those who are in the chat, um, I hope that people found the tutorial on Monday to be valuable. Um, if you have any thoughts about the mode in which the tutorial ran, in which I was in 2006 and there were a number of people who were there as well and everybody else was tuning in online, um, if you thought that either that was a helpful model or an unhelpful model, if there were things that were good about it or things that were bad about it, I would genuinely appreciate feedback. So you know, just drop me an email and let me know what you thought of that whole model of having the tutorial and if you think it would be a good model or a bad model for possibly lectures for the rest of the semester. Changing anything from the way that we have been doing it by default would require some doing and uh, some effort and some convincing people of whether or not it's the right thing to do. So, but before even thinking about embarking on that journey, of course, I'd like to know what you think. If it wasn't a valuable activity, then, well, we won't put the effort into doing it. If, however, it was a valuable thing, or you think it might be a valuable thing, then that's something where maybe I could investigate the, the effort that would be required to do that. All right, so we've got some answers starting to just trickle in this morning. Okay, uh, someone in the chat said that, uh, that they're feeling tired, and maybe they're not the only one. Uh, there's also some news in the chat about the lab. It looks like from now on, the lab sessions on Thursday will be in CSF 2112, which is very nice. So the same room as all of the other lab sections. So hopefully that will be uh, a nice experience with those shiny new computers and those shiny new high resolution high resolution monitors and a little bit of natural light that comes in the room while we're doing the lab even. Uh, oh, sorry, you can't see the question. Of course you can't see the question because my face is in the way. So the question is, what will this module print when it gets imported? So yes, that makes total sense now why the answers weren't really trickling in. So now the real question is not so much why were the answers coming in so slowly? The answer, the question is now, why were there any answers coming in at all? Hmm. That's an interesting question. Okay, um, and on the midterm, so I guess we have scanned them into grade scope um, and started with the marking process. And we will have, so there's been some rubric items created and stuff, and we'll have TAs who are going to be doing some of that marking. I marked some of the questions on some of the exams just to kind of get the ball rolling. Um, and yeah, I'm seeing a variety of answers and a variety of people doing different things. Um, you know, so I was looking at question four, the one where you had to define a function, and for the most part, it looked quite good. Uh, there were some instances, though, where I said, you know, define a function that will do blah, 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 and there were you know, some places where I didn't see a function being defined at all. Um, so, you know, there's a variety of levels of response, and 
if this is something where you're kind of confused about, well, what is a function and how do I define it, then do reach out so we can chat and, you know, try to help you figure it out uh, before we get to the end of the semester and the final exam. All right, so uh, let's close this out in just a few seconds. I'm going to close it in maybe something like five, four, three, two, one, and done. Okay, now let's take a look at the responses that people had. Okay, so uh, we said, what will this module print when it is imported? So it might print foo3 returns and then the value of foo3. Uh, so it might print foo3 returns 45. It might print foo3 returns 6. Yeah, it might print nothing or a blank, yeah. And the correct answer here is, actually this module, when we import it, is not gonna print anything. Now why would that be? So if we have this module, x equals 42, and we define this function foo, which takes a parameter called x and a parameter called y, and we return x plus y, and then if name is equal to main print foo3 returns, reruns, no, returns foo of 3. So we will save that. All right, so I'm going to save that in a file called example.py. Oops, I called it examples.py. All right, that's fine. Uh, so here, let's import examples, and let's see what happens when we run this code. So we will debug this script, and I will... Oh, sorry, I didn't have Thani open. Now I have Thani open before we actually get to the important part. Uh, someone says, classic no Thani movement moment. Yes. That is true. I feel like there could be t-shirts or something. Uh, remember that time Dr. Anderson forgot to open Thani? <laughs> yeah, classic. Um, all right. Uh, so here we are. We're importing examples.py. And how did we do that? Well, the Python interpreter said, well, you want to import a module called examples. Let me see if I can find a file called examples.py somewhere around these parts. And the answer is yes, we did find a file called examples.py. So let's... Uh, figure out what's going on here. So we uh, we create a variable called x, and we initialize it with the value 42. We create a function called foo, and we gave y a default argument. So um, at this point, when we're defining the function, now this is not something that you needed to get right in order to get the question right, but it is a really interesting thing to look at. At this point, when we're defining the function, uh, x as this parameter, we're, we're not inside the function where we have access to any local variables yet. So actually, when y it has a default argument of x, the thing that it refers to is the only x that we can find thus far, which is this global variable. So interestingly enough, uh, this turns into a default argument of 42 for y. So I can see why people said, I can see why huh, people said uh, foo3 returns 45. I can totally get that. Um, then we hit this conditional. So we have imported examples from a script file. And so now we're looking at this examples.py code and we're importing the module. So this underscore underscore name, what's that going to contain? What does that contain? So this variable that's defined for us by the Python interpreter, and remember those variables that have like underscore, underscore before them and after them, those are typically variables that are kind of automatically defined for us by the Python interpreter. Right, it's going to contain the word examples. So it's going to check, is name equal to main? Well, what is name? Name is examples. Examples is not equal to main, which means if false, well, that means we just don't 
execute that next line of code. So this is an example of something that I had suggested. If you're going to write some Python code and you want to have test code in your file, but you're also going to be like submitting it to Gradescope, for example. And by the way, uh, assignment three, the auto grader, unfortunately, I hadn't opened the auto grader queue until like last night, just before the midterm. Uh, so it is open now, but uh, if this maybe has car caused people any hardship, I've given you an extra couple of days to, to get that assignment in. Um, and so if you're going to upload code to Gradescope, what you don't want is for my test code to say, all right, let's import that student's work. And when that happens, it like runs a bunch of extra code and expects user input or talks to the internet or, you know, it, we don't want any stuff happening that we didn't expect to happen. And so it's a good idea if you're going to write test code right there in that file to put it inside of a conditional such as if name is equal to main. Um, an even better approach, of course, is to have test code that's in a completely separate file, like test.py or something. Um, because then, as we've said, you can share that. You can share the test code amongst your friends and you can like improve on each other's test code and say, oh, I've added some tests that catch something that your code didn't catch. Um, the actual assignment code is individual work and you should do your individual work individually. Uh, but the test code, you can share freely. So that's fantastic. Okay, so that is that question. So hopefully that's a little clearer now as to why that actually prints nothing. If it printed anything, it would have printed foof of three returns 45. That's what it would have printed. However, it actually doesn't print anything. All right, so let's continue on. Um, so we've just been talking a little bit about modules and we've seen that we have different modules uh, or that we now know how to write modules for it or we sorry I'm also a little tired I was up late <laughs> getting my grading uh started and getting all the grading infrastructure in place so we could get the TAs going all right let's try this one more time one second there we go a little caffeine can help okay so we've been talking about modules we now know how we can create a python file which is something that can be imported as a module so we we can write modules um the Python standard library comes with modules like math, but we've also seen other kinds of modules like ng1020. And we have kind of had you write something in the lab that would cause you to download this ng1020 module, but we haven't really talked about how that worked. It was just a little magical. So now we'll explain how that magic worked. Now you'll also remember um, that we have been talking thus far in the course about things like iteration. We've said that we can iterate over strings, we can iterate over ranges, we can iterate over lists, and in general we can use a for loop to iterate over a bunch of things. For each thing in a bunch of things, do something with each thing, where here each thing is a loop variable, we can call it whatever we want. Sometimes it's i if it's like an index, or sometimes it's x if it's a value. It might be temperature, or it might be for grade in class results, or it might be for, um, for candidate in election results. So Munsu was having an election recently, or maybe still is, I'm not sure. Um, so maybe we would have for each vote in all of the votes you know, in ballots, for vote in ballots or something, then we might want to add up how many people voted for this person, that person, that person, etc. So we can, uh, we can iterate over these types, string, list, range, but we said there are going to be other types that we're going to learn about in the future that we'll be able to do even more stuff with. And someone even asked a question in, I think it was the tutorial, about arrays. And I said, well, we haven't actually talked about arrays yet, so don't worry about arrays just yet. Well, guess what? Today is the day. And then over the coming weeks, we'll talk about more data types like sets and dictionaries, uh, which are also really, really useful. But what are we going to do today? So we're going to look a little bit at Python packages, which is a way of distributing Python modules from my computer up to a computer on the internet and then down to all of your computers or from our lab instructor's computer up to a computer on the internet and then out to all of your computers. Um, we are going to look in just a little bit more detail about how we use this matplotlib 
package, which I kind of introduced previously when we were talking about objects and methods. Um, but we're going to look at matplotlib and numpy, or numpy, depending who you ask, which stands for numerical Python, and how these two things are very, very commonly used together to do a bunch of neat stuff with Python. Um, so if you had been thinking, well, if I want to plot something, I guess I have to do that in either Excel or MATLAB. Well, no, the answer is, uh, or the good news is that there are much richer plotting tools that are available to you than just Excel and MATLAB. Um, and along the way, we'll also mention arrays. So does that sound exciting? Well, I mean, even if it doesn't sound exciting, it's what we're going to talk about anyway. So um, if you write a Python module, you can write a file save it as something.py, and then it's a module that if you save in your current local directory that you could open it from yeah, the, a script in the same directory by running import something. But suppose you want to take that module and share it with other people. Suppose, as is the case for us, we have written a module that is full of useful code for students in Engineering 1020, and we want to share that with the students in Engineering 1020. How do we share that with people? So one option would be, I guess I could just like take the code and drop it in an email and send an email to you, and then everybody would have to remember to take ng1020.py. Well, actually, you'd have to take a directory hierarchy called ng1020, and that contains other things, which contains other things, which contains other things. You have to take all that stuff and put it next to your lab3.py script, for example. We could do that, um, but that's A, a lot of hassle. B, it's a bit risky because it would be really easy to imagine that different people then end up with different versions of the code or somebody has a hard time putting it in place. Um, somebody ends up putting the wrong files in the wrong places. Yeah, that, that's not a great answer. Uh, so a much better answer is to have something called a package in a package repository. Um, so one such place is called PyPy, which is the Python package index. And PyPy is full of packages that have been written by people um, to help improve your experience of programming in Python. Uh, so let's see. For example, all right, I'll type the full name, Beautiful Soup which might sound like a really silly name, uh, but Beautiful Soup is a really, really useful package if you have a web page and you want to pull data out of it. You want to kind of what's do, do what's called screen scraping, take that web page and extract a bunch of useful information. I use this because, unfortunately, some of the tools that I have... Um, for, some of the tools that I have for looking at class lists and stuff are... Not the best. Um, and so, in fact, I will sometimes open a web page inside of a tool called Banner that we use to manage lots of things about the academic back end of the university and actually scrape information out of there by saying, okay, here is a table that I could look at this table, which contains 120 names and student numbers, or I could just extract the student numbers using a tool a tool that I've written in Python. And so there's tools like Beautiful Soup, or if you're interested in talking to things on the internet, um, there's this really lovely Python package called Requests, and you can use that to talk to computers on the internet and get information from them. And these two often are used together. You use the requests package to go get some data from a computer on the internet, you use Beautiful Soup to parse that data and turn it into something. Um, it's even better when the uh, it's even better when the website will provide you with data in a format that you don't have to screen scrape, but that isn't always the case. So PyPy contains all kinds of really useful things, including there's this package called ng1020. And interestingly, when you search for ng1020, you get two things. One is our library, um, and another one is something from Geeks for Geeks, E-N-G-I, um, with some Chinese characters. So, interesting. Um, not 100% sure what that is, but, yeah, anyway. Um, so, Engineering 1020, this is a package that you can install, which includes a module, and that module is called ng1020, and it has submodules like ng1020.arduino, and that has a submodule, so we can use things like ng1020.arduino.arduino. API. 
The other thing that you will find here, uh, which is really, really important information when we're thinking about software distribution. So remember I said previously that writing code is not like writing a math assignment where the objective is to get to an answer, right, to uh, an equation or a formula or a number or something like that. Instead, it's more like writing an essay or writing a book <laughs> in some cases. Um, it's more like creating written you know, literature almost. And we said that that is true in terms of the way we think about how we write, in programming, but it's also true in the way that the legal system sees software. So software can be protected by copyright, or in fact it is protected by copyright, just in the same way that anything you write, uh, like a book, is automatically protected by copyright. You don't have to apply for copyright or ask for copyright. If you write code, then it is implicitly copyrighted by you, whether you say so or not. And so one really really important thing when we are distributing software, when we mean for other people to be able to copy our software, take our software and do something with it, is to include software license information. So you'll see here uh, that the NG1020 package is licensed under something called the MIT license, which is an open source software license that explicitly says you are allowed to take this code, and even though you didn't write it, I, the author, give you permission to take it, copy it, modify it, use it for basically whatever purposes you like. If we didn't have that information, then it would actually be a copyright violation for you to take somebody else's code and change it or, or just take it at all, just to copy, that would be a, a copyright problem. And so in order to host code on PyPy, you, there's a bunch of different licenses you can use, but you do have to provide the software under some kind of a license agreement that allows other people to download this software. Otherwise, without some kind of a software license, you're not allowed to do that. Um, someone says, how or can we upload our own packages? Yes, you absolutely can. So you can create packages on PyPy. Uh, I won't go into all the details of that right now, but if you create an account on PyPy, uh, then you can register names and say, I'm going to be the person who creates a package with this name, John's Awesome Sauce. There we go, that could be a package name that I will upload stuff to. And then if you are the owner of, or if you're the person who registered that name, then you can upload packages under that name. Someone says, can we import packages for the term project? Ah, that's an excellent question. Um, yes, but, <laughs> uh, so I would say we, we have definitely allowed students to import packages because, for example, some people want to use the Pygame framework in order to do two-dimensional drawing and stuff, etc. And so that's fantastic. Um, you're, you're almost certainly going to need to use the NG1020 package as part of your project. But... Um, if you're, we also do want you to demonstrate that you can write code that does certain things. And so if you're, you can't just download someone else's package and use that as your project, uh, but you can use other people's work in your project in order to do things. If there's any doubt at all, the best thing, the best, best thing is to put it in your project proposal and say, here's what I intend to do. And you should be hearing more about that soon. Um, and, and just, you know, if you say, is it cool if I do this? The answer is probably going to be, yeah, yeah, totally awesome. Do that. So how do we install packages? So you've probably seen this in the lab already, uh, but this tool called pip is the Python installer of package. Hmm, actually, I'm not sure what pip, I forget what pip stands for rather. Uh, I have known, but anyway, pip is a tool that we can use to install packages from PyPy. Um, and so if we want to install the ng1020 package, we may have had you open a terminal and type pip install ng1020. And whenever we change the ng1020 module to or package to add new functionality, we will update that and we'll often tell you then, okay, can you please 
reinstall the ng1020 module. So you can do this from the command line, which in Windows is called the command prompt. In Mac OS, we have a terminal. In Linux, we have a terminal emulator. There's lots and lots of ways to open this command line, which gives you a dialogue with the computer. So you say something, you give it a command, say, hey, computer, do this. And it says, okay, here are the results of doing that. Um, and so, and within a Python inter interpreter, it's also possible to do this. So you can import pip, and then you can use pip's main function and pass it a list of strings, where the list of strings would be include, would be install ng1020, and then any other packages that you want to list as well. Um, oh, some excellent use of emoji going on in the chat. Well done, folks. Um, okay, so let's install some packages. So um, now I showed you earlier in the semester that in Thony, you can also manage packages. And so for example, in Thony, I've already installed the ng1020 package. Now I actually have an old version. You see that my currently installed version is 4.03. The new version is 5.11, so okay, I better upgrade that. So I'll get that started. All right, there we go. So now I've got the most up-to-date version of ng1020. And it's important that the version of the Python package matches the version of the firmware that's running on your device. So if you're going to have, uh, no, no, this is the wrong device. This is something that we're using in the operating systems course. Uh, so that's something we might get to a little bit later if you go into computer engineering. Speaking of going into computer engineering, did I mention that there's an open house this afternoon from five to seven? So if you like pizza or you like ECE or you like both, it's an inclusive or. Yeah. It's a thing that you could go to. Anyway, uh, so we can install some packages like ng1020, but also it'd be a good idea to, uh, at this point, install some packages like matplotlib and numpy. And wouldn't you know it, I did the thing again. <sighs> Sorry, when I was searching for, when I was talking about how my ng1020 is out of date, I was gesturing at things here and here and here. Yeah. Clearly, I should have like a production assistant, somebody who's sitting here with like headphones on and a clipboard and, you know, uh, running a, a video board or a video mixer or something. Anyway, um, okay, so once we install these packages, now we're ready to do some more stuff. Uh, someone says should have a counter. Counter in the sense of somebody to count things or a counter that I'm working on, as if this is like a a food network show or something. Yeah. I'm going to leave that package simmering over here while I come over here and prepare the pastry. Yeah, that, that would be kind of fun. Um, okay, so let's think about some more mathematical operations that we might like to do. So we've seen things like this in the past, right? So we have primitive values. Here are some ints and we can add them together or we can do a modulus operation or something. We've also seen that there is a math module in the Python standard library that gives us access to additional functions that can do things like compute the sine of something or compute a logarithm for something. Um, but what about lists, right? So let's say, and look at me, I'm turning Thony on. You see, my CPU is a neural net a learning computer. Um, so from math import star, let's say that I wanted to, actually, you know what, I'm gonna do this in the script. So let's say I've got some X values and uh, they're gonna be zero and pi over two and pi and three times pi over two. Well, where are we getting pi? Let's import math. And we'll do it this way. Math dot pi over two. Math dot pi, three times math dot pi over two. Okay, um, so how can I compute the sine of each of these values? So, you know, let's do this in even a slightly different way. It's fun to mix up the ways that we do things because we've got lots of options here. So let's say from math import pi. So that way we can keep this as just a nice simple use of the word pi. All right, so if I want to compute the sine of all of these x values and store it in 
an array called Ys, how do I do that? Boy, we're really, really quiet today in the chat. We must all be tired. Or in post midterm blues or something. <laughs> all right. All right. Well, if no one wants to talk, that's okay. Um, so if we wanted to, so what we couldn't do, for example, is to say, well, let's import the sign function from the math module and let's call sign of x's, right? What does this error mean? So type error must be real number, not list. So we can't pass a list of values into the math sign function. So what are we gonna do instead? Well, we might have to do something like this. For x in all of our x's, y's plus equals sign of x. There we go. So one at a time, we will iterate through the x's list and then we will append the sign of x to our value of y's. So we can do it in this way, y's plus equals sign of x, or now we've seen we can use the append method if we like, either way is fine. Okay, so having done that, we have these values of x's and we have these values of y's. And notice uh, the y's start at zero and then they go up to one and then they go down to 1.22466799147353232 times 10 to the negative 16. That's pretty darn close to zero, but it's not exactly zero, because remember, computers have limits, and uh, there are limits to the precision with which we can represent a floating point number, and sometimes those limits matter. Now, in this case, in 10 to the minus 16, that's basically zero, so we're saying that... Um, if we have x values that are 0, pi over 2, pi, 3 pi over 2, our y values, the sign of that would be 0, 1, 0, negative 1. That kind of sounds right for a sign, but it's kind of tedious that we have to do it this way, right? We have to manually iterate through each value. Is there a better way? And the answer, of course, since I'm asking it, is yes. So um, there is a package called NumPy or NumPy, which provides numerical tools for operating on numbers and operating on large numbers of numbers. And NumPy provides mechanisms for doing things that are much, much more efficient than working with lists. So if I wanted to compute the cumulative sum of 4 million integers, I would not do that with a Python list. I would instead do that in NumPy and I would use a data type called an array. So let's have a look at this. Um, so NumPy defines some additional versions of some math functions that are a little bit more flexible and can do a bit more stuff for us. So we saw before when we imported the sign function from the math module, uh, we saw that we weren't able to use the, um, we weren't able to pass a list into sign because you can only calculate the sign of one number at a time. Um, however, when we're using NumPy, so let's forget about the sign in the math module. Let's now instead use the sign in the NumPy module, which comes from the NumPy package. Well, now it's going to take a moment to load because I haven't loaded NumPy in here in a while. And so it's going to take a second. There we go. Uh, the next time we load NumPy, it should be quicker. So now we again have X's and we have Y's. But, but what do you notice that's different about the Y's this time? So last time, uh, actually, that you don't see that anymore. Um, last time, we computed Ys one at a time, and we just appended to a list, and we saw 0, comma, 1, comma, 1.22464 times 10 to the negative 6. That's about the same. And then we saw negative 1. What do we see this time? What's different here about this? Yeah. 
Sheesh, I feel like a comic who's bombing here. Is this thing on? Um, sorry. Uh, yeah, so we see zero, E, zero. Right, so the first number here in this list is no longer being represented as an integer zero or even as a floating point number that's like close-ish to zero. Uh, we're seeing very explicitly that every element in this sequence of numbers is a floating point number and we're representing them in a consistent similar well in a consistent way we're showing scientific notation for all of them what else do we see before the square bracket here what else do we see before this square bracket and after that square bracket right we see that this is an array and so this is a different data type from a list. Um, and this is something that NumPy provides and that has some important differences. So some things that we saw here is that we were able to take something iterable like a list and pass it directly to NumPy's sign function. And it and NumPy's sign function, when we passed it a bunch of values, it gave us a bunch of values back. It gave us an array of values. So what are NumPy arrays? Well, NumPy arrays are kind of like lists in that it is an ordered sequence of things. So the order matters and something at element two or something at element 17, th those are different positions and the order matters. Um, but in a NumPy array, every element has the same type. So I think I mentioned this in our little tutorial, but if I wanted to, uh, I could have a list that contains one 3.14 and the string hello world, no problem at all. Even though they all have completely different data types, a list in Python is a list of values and each of those values can be a value of a different type, totally fine. But a NumPy array says all of these elements, there must be consistency. They have to be the same type, um, which is a bit limiting in one way. You can't put whatever you want in them. But on the other hand, it's also quite freeing because you know that everything in there is the same type. So you don't have to worry about, oh, what if there's a string halfway through my list of uh, grades or something? Um, Suppose I have temperature readings in my office every five minutes over the past three months, in which there's wild variation. <laughs> Things were in the new building, the HVAC systems are not quite up to snuff yet, and it was freezing in here for months. And now I think it's 27 or 28 degrees. Like, ugh, maybe a sweater is a bad idea. Um, but anyway, so uh, it's kind of freeing to know that we're not going to accidentally put a Boolean value or a string or something in the middle of our array of temperature readings. So that, that can be really, really helpful. It also allows NumPy to represent those things much more efficiently than if it were in a list. So the operations that we can perform on NumPy arrays are so much faster than the operations we can perform on lists, which doesn't matter if you only have a list with like half a million elements in it. Eh, who cares? But if we're going to build a big NumPy matrix that has 4 billion values in it and do lots of computation on that, that really matters a lot. So a NumPy array is something that requires us to have all the elements have to have the same type, but also we can do math with them directly with these arrays. So you can add lists together. And actually, why don't we do that? So here I've got uh, L1 is equal to 1, 2, 3. L2 is equal to 4, 5, 6. So L1, L2. If I type L1 plus L2, what am I going to see? What's the result going to be? We've been using plus equals with lists already, so that kind of implies what we're going to see. What will I see when I press enter now? We'll see L1 plus L2. What's that going to give us? There's typing happening. There is typing happening. Yeah, there we go. So we're going to see these things are going to be concatenated. One, two, three, four, five, six. Kind of like... I can concatenate strings 
together. Um, but very often, when we're doing numerical computation, scientific computing, that kind of thing, um, what we really are interested in is being able to add different elements in an array to each other. And so that is something that we will see now. So let's see, from numpy import array. All right, so if we have an array that contains one, two, and three, and another array contains four, five, and six, and notice in order to construct that array, in this case, we one way to build an array is to take a list and turn it into an array, just like we could kind of convert a string into an integer by having the int function parse that integer for us. So here we have a1 and a2. Um, and now when I say a1 plus a2, what I get is not something that's longer. I get something where I've added all of the elements of it together. I can also do interesting things like multiply these together. So NumPy provides lots of useful functions. Um, it provides a function that is called linspace, which is kind of like range, except instead of only having to have integer values that go from something up to something, but not including it, we can say, give me 100 numbers between 0 and 2 pi. And you know, divide that up into a hundred, and ho however you got to do it, I don't really care. Just just give me a hundred numbers or a thousand numbers between something and something, which can be really helpful. And those will be floating point numbers. Uh, it also gives us, uh, for those who are taking Math 2050 or those who have taken Math 2050 recently, uh, it gives us dot product and cross product functions. So if we have two arrays, we can take the dot product of them or we can take the cross product of them. Uh, which did I have just a second ago when I said A1 times A2? What is that? Is that a dot product or a cross product? Nobody wants to say? All right. Well, the fact that we didn't end up with a two-dimensional matrix should suggest... Uh, oh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> that was the... Uh, <laughs> that wasn't a dot product. <laughs> that was the um, the, the pairwise um, scalar... Pro no, not scalar product. Oh, oh dear. Now that I've gone and panicked myself, I'm forgetting words. Oh, well, that's fine. Um, but it definitely wasn't a cross product either because a... Uh, yeah. Anyway, so we have the dot product and the cross product that are available. And we have other really, really useful functions, like I mentioned earlier, cum sum to find the cumulative sum of things. So add up all the numbers thus far. That turns out to be really helpful for, for example, turning a statistical PDF into a CDF and lots of other stuff. Uh, and other kinds of general numerical things like uh, greatest common divisor, least common multiple, etc. There's also a convolve function, which is super handy for signal processing super super handy for like you take some audio and then you want to convolve it with a filter that will filter out certain frequencies to cut out that really annoying sound in the background or something like that but you know you get to turn four and do signals and systems then then that will make a bit more sense all right and numpy we typically use it very closely with matplotlib, which I've introduced a little bit earlier. So with matplotlib, the simplest way to use matplotlib is to plot x values against y values. So let's change our code here. Uh, let's see. From matplotlib.pyplot, import star. So matplotlib.pyplot gives us a really easy to use API for plotting things, such as if I've got these x values and I've got these y values, well, now I can plot my x's and my y's. And when I do that, I will get Python start to open. And of course, <laughs> it won't work when I'm doing the live demo. Err. Anyway, uh, well, I could, if I had a moment, I would do run it in a different context, but that that's okay. Um, or will I?
There we go. There we go. Um, and so you can see here is our plot of the sine function. Now, oh, sorry, no, you don't see. Now you see, here is our plot of the sine function. Now that's not like a really good plot, is it? What's wrong with that? This is the kind of thing we will sometimes see in a lab. I'll say, uh, can you plot and characterize the relationship between two things? And then I'll see a plot that kind of looks like this. Does this look like a sine function? The answer is no, but what's what's wrong with this plot? I mean, I did calculate x values, and I calculated y values that came from those x values, so what's wrong with it? Yeah, there's too few points, so this is not a good way to characterize the behavior of a real function. Um, instead, what would be handy would be if we could use Let's get some help with the lin space function. So you see lin space, we pass it some parameters, and we can pass it a lot of parameters, but we can also just say here's a start and a stop. So let's say that we want a linear space between 0 and 2 times pi. Okay, so that is a linear space between 0 and 2 times pi. Then we're going to have our y's. Now we're going to plot this. And, oh, let's just import everything from NumPy. And now, lo and behold, with the default 50 data points, now we get something that is starting to look like an actual sine function. So that is much better. Okay. Um, and we can add some additional stuff if we want to. So, in fact, why don't I... That... The plot that I showed you a second ago is still not a plot that would get a whole lot of marks in a lab report because what? Are, is this 1.0 cats for every 1.4 cheeseburgers? Like, what is that? 1.67 cheeseburgers, rather? Um, that, that's not a great plot. Uh, so let's add some additional detail. np.lin space from 0 to 2 times pi. Okay, um, let's add a plot style, which is kind of an optional thing, but is a nice thing. Um, there are a whole bunch of different plotting styles, color schemes and stuff you can get, some of which are friendly to uh, people who have color blindness or various kinds of color blindness and some of which are not. Here is um, a function that we're gonna use to actually do the plotting and we're plotting from this, we're using this module called matplotlib.py plot, but we're importing it as plot. Um, alternatively, I could have said from matplotlib.py plot import star, in which case we would just do this. Um, and we give a title to our figure and an X label and a Y label. And then finally we call this show function. And when we do that, oh, let's stop that interpreter that was running. And when we do that, Thani hangs because of course it does. Uh, oh, right. From math import pi, there we go. And so now when we do this, you see I've said let's plot x and y, um, but let's give some additional style information. Let's use a red color and use a dashed line rather than a solid line because maybe I wanna have a solid line for one thing and a dashed line for something else. Um, and so we can start to pretty quickly come up with you know, nice looking and very informative plots, which is very, very helpful for all kinds of things. And I think you're gonna be doing something like that in the lab, if not, to, if not this week, then next week. And so we can also do bar, uh, bar graphs, and we can do histograms, and we can do all kinds of stuff. And so there is this um, PyPlot tutorial that's available on the Matplotlib website, which will walk you through doing a bunch of things in order to be able to plot phenomena. And now that we can 
access physical sensors and a physical device in the lab, temperature sensors, light sensors, stuff like that. And now that we can plot things on the screen, actually we could do things like over the course of a minute in the lab, take a bunch of temperature readings and then plot them and then do things like, well, if you put your hand over it and take it away, then you could see it warm up and then see it cool down. And we can start relating, we can start writing code that relates the physical world to pictures that we draw on a screen, which is kind of cool. At least I hope you find it cool too. Um, and then, yeah, we can have a better sign plot, which I've already showed you. So NumPy is an extremely useful package that provides us with things like arrays, which are really good for representing large numbers of values that all are, yeah, large numbers of values that all have the same type. Um, and it's really good at allowing us to add all the values of an array together, multiply all the values of an array together. But NumPy also gives us additional mathematical functions that would allow us to do even more stuff, dot products and cross products and all kinds of neat stuff. Um, and then one thing that we often do with those results is plot them. Instead of just printing out, here's a table of values, it's much more engaging for a reader to see something visual that they can look at the relationship between these quantities and these quantities, which is super helpful. And that's also a good excuse for us to learn just that little bit about how we can import packages. And in fact, if you wanted to, how you could create packages. You could take your... Um, you could take your project that you do in this course and you could publish it as a package on PyPy if you wanted to. You don't have to, but you certainly could. Um, so there's lots and lots more stuff that you can explore, but these are really, really useful things that all different kinds of engineers want to be able to do with Python. So remember, programming is not just for people who see a future for themselves in software development. It's also for people who just want to be able to plot results that they got from a physical experiment about the the sheer load on concrete before it fractured over time. I mean, it's useful for all kinds of engineering. Okay, uh, so that is it for now. Uh, let's see, I've got a question that I see in the chat that relates to an assignment. I might respond to that in the chat um, rather than live. Um, but yeah, so that, that's it for today. And so I hope you find this very useful and kind of uh, have fun, go out and practice with this stuff. And I can't emphasize that enough. I mean, I've tried to emphasize it throughout the course, but when I give you a new idea, a new concept, don't just passively consume and say, hmm, that seems kind of interesting. I bet you if I had to do that, I could. No, actually try it and play with it and explore and, and give yourself time like say I'm going to set aside 20 minutes to play with this new thing that I learned in yesterday's lecture or in today's lecture and just play with it and see how far you go and how much new stuff you can do in whatever 20 minutes if your time is limited because you got lots of courses etc you can set aside a chunk of time and say I'm just going to play with this thing and the more you do that the more you get familiar with these tools um, the better you're going to better positioned you're going to be for success in things like exams. Remember, in programming courses, you don't really need to study for exams a whole lot. Really, what you need to do is just throughout the whole semester, write lots of code. And the more you practice, the better you'll be at it. So uh, I guess that's it for today. So we will see each other again on Friday. And don't forget, if you have any feedback about that kind of uh, delivery modality that we did on Monday with me being in 2006 and people tuning in both in person and online, do send me feedback because that'd be really useful information. So have a lovely rest of your day.